like a, a day in the life of you and Anthony's friendship, or where, where, where did the inspiration come from? Uh, basically, the movie was really inspired by all of our lives. Okay. Um, there's a lot of biographical elements to it, but really the inception was Edgemi. Can you talk about how you created those characters? Oh, yeah. Um, wow, that was cool. I haven't seen the movie in a while. Um, yeah, the, the characters were, uh, you know, I've always been a prankster, a jokester, growing up as a kid. And, and I, started, I started impersonating my dad. And, and I started doing it at camp. We're all, we're all scouts. And I started doing it at camp. And, um, and one by one, everybody really liked it. They just kept calling the other scout members, and they're like, Adrian, Adrian, do it again, do it again. And, and, uh, and yeah, and you know, I mean, that, that, that's where Robert, uh, the, the dad, came from was just, you know, uh, just as a joke, you know, uh, me just making fun of my dad, making fun of me. So, uh, and then, and then Rima came afterwards. I mean, I'll never forget the day that we came up with the character of Rima because, I mean, would you say that Robert was always inside of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Edmund, yeah, absolutely. Both of them were. So Edgemi would always get in trouble yeah, as a kid, even, even probably now, and his dad would always, you know, Wait, what was the you would always get in trouble as a kid. You're trouble. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so I remember I mean, when, when we had I always hit my report card, and all that, like 99% of that stuff is things that were said directly to me. And, uh, I mean, I was a good kid, but I definitely hit my report card and lied about it and all that stuff. Um, so I'll never forget, we had made this short film uh, a long time ago where he plays Robert uh, talking to Narva, and I remember we were like, oh, we should make a second one, and we were trying to come up with an angle. We're like, what can we do different this time? And I'll never forget this day. Where Edge being, we were drinking. We were, we were just thinking, like, you know, I, you know, the first video was such a success where we're like, okay, we, you know, they'd be stupid not to make another video, and we're sitting there thinking of ideas, and that's when it hit me. I'm like, what better, um, what better thing to make than I'm not used to these mics. I just remember Edge being looked at me. He's like, Stubbuck, do you think you could buy a blonde wig? And I was like, why? And then he's yeah. like, you could get a Rima. Yeah, and that's where Rima came in, and um, and. Rima was actually a, a, an impersonation of my neighbor. I want to buy a home for her. <laughs> She's a great woman. I don't know where she is now. I hope she doesn't hate me or anything. But um, she was actually just like the movie. <laughs> she better call me. So you guys didn't have the idea of making the feature before the, the shorts on, on YouTube. It kind of like came out of that, right? That yeah, right? yeah. We made the shorts. They were doing really well, and people kept wanting to see more shorts. And um, at the time. We figured, why not make a movie? And I guess we didn't really know that you couldn't do that, so we just did it. I got my dad's home video camera, and we all got together. I forced all my friends and cousins to like give up their weekends so they can come hang out with me. Um, yeah, I, I usually ask filmmakers up here about uh, you know how they have the financing, the budget, and you know financing is a big part. You need money to make a film, but you guys did it with, for basically nothing. And so they yeah. were all slave labor. It was, it was and yeah, everyone here worked for free. They slave labor. financed by slave labor. That's I mean, right. the best the best part was the because we all grew up together and we did work together at Scouts. You know, we built sarcophagus rooms together and all that stuff. So we all had a really good uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We had a good bond together. We already knew how to work together, and it just, things went smoothly when we were all on set. Well, things didn't always go smoothly though. Um, the very first day that we shot the movie was the scene where Robert was, you know, crying to his family on the street in the middle of the night, asking for them to forgive him. And I don't know if you guys remember what happened. We we had never, I'd never made it. This my first movie ever. And uh, we were shooting at 4 a.m. in Santa Clarita. We have a guy screaming in Armenian in the middle of the night. And then when we're packing up to leave, I remember like we see like three cop cars are coming down with their sirens on. So we're thinking, oh, okay, we'll just be like, oh, sorry, officer, you know, student film, we're gonna go home. No, they, they came with guns. Like, they pointed guns at all of us. Like, they slammed my sister against the hood of a car. And the worst is like, they're like, what are you guys doing? And then Edmund comes out wearing a bra and a wig. And was, yeah, so, so, you know, get permits. That's my advice. So a lot of success ever since this uh, set. You want to talk about kind of your journey since um, this film and, and where you are now? Yeah, I'll talk about it really briefly. Um, right after I, right after this movie came out, I got into USC, um, which was my dream come true to go into the film program there. And uh, uh, and and everything I learned on this movie served me a hundred times incredibly when I was making real student films with real budgets and, and real real uh, directors and people involved, but. This movie will always be to me like my biggest success. No matter what other movies I make, if I ever make any other movies, I'll never have a project that's so personal to me, full of my friends and family, that as this one was. But yeah. Uh, 
this movie, I, you know, I, I, I just don't remember it being so good the second time I, 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 I'm watching it this time around. It's been five years, and I can't believe that we all actually pulled it off. And Do you have people coming up to you and, and doing the impersonation to you? Oh, yeah. All the time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of died down now, you know, and I don't wear my goatee. I used to wear that goatee on a regular basis, but, um, you know, at, as soon as that, I mean, when... When Sevak posted the first video online, I was um, I didn't have internet at the time, and you know I really didn't have any connection with any of my friends, or like he didn't tell me, and, and we didn't know or anything. And I got I, I was at work one day, and um, a friend calls me, laughing hysterically on the phone, and all all that can come out of his mouth is "Edge me, you internet hilarious." I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? It's, everybody knows. <laughs> And so, you know, I asked him some questions and I, and I found out that it was that it was the video and um, ever since then, yeah, you know, especially after those videos and the movie, <clears throat> anywhere I go home, people, 7-Eleven, um, at a certain point, to be honest, I would have to drive out of the city to buy a Red Bull because, you know, I'm just not... I'm curious to know if, like, any of you other actors have had experiences like that. Me not really. I have, I have, I think there was like one party I went to where they're like, "Oh, you're Arbo," and I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "What's your name?" I'm like, "Arbo." He's like, "Oh my god." <laughs> and then he's like, "Oh, man, you speak good English." I'm like, "I'm like, yeah." I'm sorry. I want to address this. Uh, I said, uh, this is Mr. K. He played himself in the movie. So, uh, I'm at a party, big party, La Cunada, and. Uh, Dr. Garo Kasabi, the famous plastic surgeon who was the tech consultant on Nip Tuck, is at this party and I see him because I used to watch Nip Tuck and I watch the DVDs. And I tell my friend, is that Dr. Garo Kasabi? He's, yeah, you want to meet him? Calls the doctor over. First thing the doctor says to me, are you the guy from my big fat Armenian family? And I was blown away, so everybody see it. So. Thank you so much, Mr. Jay, for letting us uh, come in the classroom. To kind of be such a big part of Armenian pop culture uh, this day, well, can you say anything about your experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it definitely has had a pretty big impact for like meeting new people and people who still recognize recognize me from the movie. But I think the one experience I can recall back to was being in a library trying to study for a test, and these two kids run up to me and they're like, "Hey, I'm like, who are these people?" You know, and I, can we get your autograph? I'm like, "What? Wow. Like your Orbital, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, but." <laughs> I mean, we're in the library, man. Don't worry. I don't want to like. I'm like, I'm not a celebrity, man. I'm just like, just like you guys. <laughs> and I felt bad. I ended up signing my like, yeah, I'm not a celebrity. We're just, we're just friends that did this. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. Um, I knew that it had gotten around because I know how big of an impact YouTube have YouTube has. But I remember I went to Armenia for the Pan Armenian Games um, when I was I think 16, 17. I remember. Um, we're at a restaurant and I got stopped and I and I got asked for a picture and I was like, this is really creepy. And then they told me why and I was like, oh, like I get it. And that that's when it really hit me how far this went and how many people had actually seen it. Because when you're you know when you're in Armenia, like I'm having a cover, but I'm like, oh, you want a picture? Like why? And it, it kind of hit me like this actually reached a lot of people, um, a lot of people. And I think it's a great thing. And I think you know it's a great. Great thing to be able to share it with everybody. Well, like for us to have parents come up to us after the, the screenings that we did five years ago and say that the movie kind of helped them be better parents was mind blowing because if that actually happened, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to give a special shout out to Alan G, who is actually a, a music producer who donated all of his time to, to make the music. Um, I, mean, I mean, everything we did was obviously like no money. We were working in Alan's closet, I think, at one point. Um, his mom was always bringing us like Armenian food, which kept us going. Um, and and I'm, I'm so it's so cool to me to see all of you guys here. Everyone's grown up. They're all attractive and, and adults now. Like, I mean, you guys. Orville has a beard. Orville has a beard. <laughs> He's probably trying to get away from his character. So, so other than the costume for the first time, was there any were there any other uh, hiccups throughout the production? Absolutely, Edgemy was a huge diva. Now his beard got bigger. Edgemy was impossible over me. He kept asking for everything in the world. We're like, Edgemy, this is a low budget production. <laughs> so when we were promoting the movie for it to come out, we uh, we did a lot of like radio interviews. We we like we walked around. We put flyers. We went to the Navasartian Games, which is you know I'm sure you guys went to our Armenian organization once a year, which is a few weeks before our premiere. And we figured let's let's do something to get publicity for the movie. So we got Edgemy. We got the wig. There may have been a little bit of alcohol involved. 
And there was this awesome publicity stunt that we did, where again, the cops came and arrested me. <laughs> so it was, oh, I it was remember so that. worth it, because I feel like we got a lot of click and soul that day. Yeah, they, it, I, I needed a little, uh, it's, uh, a little motivation to get that going, but once we, once we got it going, it was a big deal, and I guess they just, you know, they, well, I think, no, I think it was all okay until I, I got on top of the golf cart. This is true. As soon as I got on top of the golf cart, they are like, alright, we gotta stop this. And he was like screaming in Rima language, like, Oh, stop, me, it's crazy! <laughs> the advice that I would give, honestly, is, if you know that you don't have money, think about what resources you have. And we were all fortunate that we have incredible friends and family around us. So every scene that you see, every location that you see is at, a, is at a relative's house or a friend's place. Every person in the movie is a friend who donated their time. Every prop, every meal. So we really, we had no, we had no money, but we basically had the support of our friends in our community. So I would say make sure you have at least one of those backing you up. Yeah. Uh, just follow, follow what you believe in, if you ask me. Um, I believe in the characters. So, um, you know, as soon as, as soon as we decided to make it, I just, you know, I mean, it, what? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy for me to put on a blonde wig, go on Glendale and walk around and stuff, but, you know, I believe in the character, it was funny, and the positive, the positive feedback, personally, was what fueled me the most, the positive feedback from our audience and our fandom and our fans. Fans and everything. And uh, I had three ideas for a sequel that I fully outlined. Are you guys interested in hearing them at all? Yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Okay, so there was one which I called the Armenian Romeo and Juliet, which is a family goes to Big Bear for Christmas. And you guys know that this is a, this is a Barska High family, an Iranian Armenian family. And their neighbor happens to be another Armenian family that are high Stansi, which are, you know, Armenian Armenian. <laughs> and they have a really cute daughter who Narva and her get in, they fall in love. But both, both fathers are like, you can't be dating him or her because they're not like us. So over the course of the movie, they fall in love, and like, you know, it, and by the end of the movie, we realize that just because you're different kinds of Armenians doesn't mean anything at all, that we're all still the same, we should still love each other. So that was the first one. The second one was my big fat Armenian wedding, which takes place six years later, and Ramallah and Orbel are now getting married. So the entire movie would show like the course from proposal to the wedding itself. You've got the drunken uncles. Arwell comes back from Iran. He's wearing a disco suit. I don't know why. I always imagine you wearing a disco suit. And, uh, and I think like Robert, Robert can't afford the wedding, and so he has to resort to Armenian fraud in order to pay for the wedding. Um, he gets all sorts of trouble. And... So that would have been another movie. And the third idea that we were working on was a very big budget one, which was like my big fat Armenian vacation, where the family. Uh, plans a trip where they're going to go to like Italy for a summer and something goes wrong and they end up in Armenia. And it's like, what? how does this family who considers themselves so Armenian but they really live in America, how do they cope when they're actually in Armenia? But yeah, so, you know, if my, if my career fails in Hollywood, I'll call you guys. <laughs> we had a full screenplay entirely written in English uh, with kind of like symbols for what's an Armenian. But the moment we started shooting, we never looked at it again. I mean, these actors, every single one of them, not just Edgemi, gave they brought so much to the parts, all improvisation. I can look at the movie and say, I can't take credit for half of what's on the screen, it's all them. Yeah, we came up with a lot of the stuff on set. We had so much fun on set. I think Sevak once told me he had to just cut all the funny parts, all the parts where everyone was laughing. As long as he cut those out of the out of the film, we, we had ourselves a film. Did you, you guys, did you guys tell when I was laughing and shaking the camera? 